Good morning, Calvary. Good morning to the virtual world. Are you ready to praise the Lord today? He brought you to the last day of the year. God's grace and mercy has brought us all the way. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. This is your call to worship. Scripture, 100 Psalm. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All ye lands, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting and his truth endure to all generations. You may be seen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we come this morning thanking you, Father, for bringing us to the last day of, another, of 2023. We've been sometimes up and sometimes down, but you brought us. We thank you, Father, for protecting us from all the dangers all around us. We thank you, Father, for supplying all of our needs. We thank you, Father, 
for just keeping us. Your grace has brought us thus far, and your mercy has sustained us. We thank you, Lord. If we had a hundred million tons, we couldn't thank you for enough. We thank you most of all for your darling son, Jesus, who bled and died on Calvary's cross and rose on the third day that we might have a right to eternal life. I pray that you bless the service today and bless the preacher who's going to bring the word today. Pray that you lift him up in all and give him power to preach our holy, righteous word. That somebody may come running saying, what must I do to be saved? We pray now that for Pastor Nelson and the entire Calvary Baptist Church family and all the church doors that stand open in your name. We pray, Father, that if there's anybody here that has not accepted Jesus Christ, we pray, Father, that you would touch them today, that they may come running saying, what must I do to be saved? Because time is running out. Time is running out, I tell you. Trouble everywhere. Dangers everywhere, wars everywhere, rumors of war. But you're, you're still in charge, Lord. Help us to hold on till you say enough done. These are another blessings I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We see Father led in the service by this great choir and this great music department. Come on, praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, this is the last day of the year. So if you haven't gotten your rock on, your sing on, your clap on, your smile on, you got one last opportunity to do it, amen. Come on, reach over and just touch a neighbor. So you, are you ready to worship? But so can, I, can you just join me by standing? We're going to sing this song, Do Not Pass Me By. And I'm going to be looking for the sopranos, the altos, and the tenors. How you like this new choir we just had come in this morning? <laughs> We ain't seen them all year. Come and say, do not pass me back. Come on, put those hands together. So here, pass me not, oh gentle Savior. Come on. Pass me not, oh gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. Hear my humble cry. While on the other side. While on the other side. Come for me. Sing, y'all. Do not. Do not pass me by. That's it. Do not pass me by. Do that one more time. Pass me not. Pass me not, oh Jesus, Savior. Hear my humble cry. Hear my humble cry. While on the other side, I'm calling. While on the other side, I'm calling. Smile and say it. Do not pass me by. That's it, that's it. Do not pass. Everybody's shouting, Savior!
ready, Alto? Come on, y'all ready, Tennis? Y'all Tennis ready? Come on, Tennis. of the songwriter come to my mind for every mountain you brought me over for every trial you've seen me through for every blessing I say 
Hallelujah. And for this, I give you praise. Hallelujah in this house. Amen. Amen. Now, I didn't get up to say all that, but, but, but I'm like you. Uh, uh, I thank God for this holiday season. Only problem I have with it, it comes too soon and it goes too soon. All right, all right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It comes too soon and goes too soon. But, but it is here. And when you think about it, God has kept us. I'm going to let you think about that. And, and, and I've been thinking about it for, for, for a few days. A few years ago, we see, saw God keep us through the pandemic. And we know the pandemic is, is still hanging around. But, but I think I got about 10 of y'all that are in here and about 20 that are watching. And, and those that are watching, you can go high five your dog, your cat. <laughs> because although we're not dealing with the medical pandemic, God has kept us and brought us through pandemic problems. And anybody here through 2023, you dealt with one problem after another, but God kept you. God brought you. So I just want to take a moment, amen, to just thank him and praise him for all he has, has done. Amen. Well, I am excited, Calvary, uh, to introduce and or present our preacher for this preaching privilege. And uh, y'all have heard a lot about him. Y'all heard about me. Uh, I don't know if I was flying or sleeping. He can kind of tell you that. Because uh, I, I, I started, I thought I was flying, but then I kind of woke up. And I guess I was doing more sleeping than flying. Uh, but I thank him for letting me be the wingman. Uh, not only is he a wing, my wingman, let me be the wingman, but he has been a friend. He has been a brother. And so I'm excited on this last day of year to come all the way from Pleasanton, Texas, to be a blessing unto us today. Pastor Pete Pavelli, the proud pastor of the Cowboy Church in Pleasanton, Texas. So come on, Calvary, let's just stretch our hands to him. And we're going to just say, Pastor Pete, Pastor Pete preach, with power, preach with power, passion, passion and persuasion. And after our music ministry has blessed us, the next voice you will hear will be that of our pe preacher, Pastor Pete Bavelic. And I'm probably tearing that last name up. Amen. Uh, but my friend, and we just going to call him Pastor Pete, he's going to come and bless us. Amen. Amen. Music ministry, bless us. And then the next voice you will hear will be that of our preacher. of his son.
forgiven of my sins. Redeemed through his blood. And redeemed through his blood. Oh, yes. Oh, you may do this one. Say, he woke me up this morning. He woke me up this morning. Yeah. Come on, is that your testimony? And he started me on my way. And he started me on my way. Yes, he did. Come on, how many can say he gave me health and strength? He gave me health and strength. Yes, he did. Come on, just to see another day. second verse one more time say he woke me up this morning he woke me up this morning yeah. come on some of y'all didn't get it he woke me up this morning he woke me up this morning okay you still ain't got it <laughs> come on tell your neighbor he woke me up this morning he woke me up this morning okay okay come on tell your other neighbor because I don't think they realize he woke me up this morning. Woke me up this morning. Say it one more time, choir. He woke me up this he woke morning. Woke me up this morning. Yeah. And he started me on my way. Yes, he did. And he started me on my way. Hallelujah. He gave me my health and my strength. Say it. Let me see another day. Let me see another day. Come on, rear back real loud and say, oh yeah. Oh yeah. I have so many reasons. I have so many reasons. To rejoice. Yes, sir. Come on, everybody, lift those hands toward heaven. Everybody singing rejoice. Come on, come on, last Sunday. Rejoice. Come on, the last Sunday of the year. Rejoice. Rejoice. I have so many reasons. So many. Come on, everybody, come on, lift your hands up and sing it real loud. Everybody in the house, rejoice. Hallelujah. This is the day that the Lord has made. I'm going to lift my voice and rejoice. One more time. Oh, oh rejoice. Oh, I got a reason to rejoice. I'm going to pray with you.
Come on, come on, tell your neighbor about your reason. Come on, just think about it and tell your neighbor, say he woke me up this morning. Wasn't supposed to be here today, but I'm here. Sick, he healed me. Broken, he fixed me. Come on, tell your neighbor your testimony, your reason. Come on, tell your neighbor your reason. Come on, tell your other neighbor that neighbor ain't acting right. Tell your other neighbor your reason. So many reasons I have, so many, so many reasons, I have so many, I have so many reasons, to be true, Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, hallelujah. 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 Amen. Praise God. Well, I'm so glad to be here today. As Brother Kevin said, my name is Pete. They just call me Pastor Pete. My name is Tough, but he nailed it. And uh, we have been friends for some time, and I thank you for the invitation, Brother Kevin. Can I tell you some reasons I have to rejoice this morning? Let me start with my beautiful wife. Right here, the First Lady, Cowboy Fellowship. Stand up, baby. Stand up so they can see you. Let them to know who you are. And then I got four more, four more reasons to rejoice. Two boys and two girls. Y'all stand up. A little shy, they're a little shy. So thankful for them. And then I'm thankful for my friendship with your pastor. Let him. Uh, years ago in Dallas, Texas, it was a chance meeting. We uh, serve on a board of directors together, and we came on the board at the same time. And, uh, our first meeting, uh, I knew he was a special man. And uh, he is a humble man, and he is a holy man. And he is a good friend. And uh, I tell you what, he, he has been a, a wingman to me as much as I have to him. We have done some traveling together and some preaching together and some praying together right, and uh, a lot right. of other things. And I tell you, you are blessed. You should rejoice because of this man right here. I know two things about Pastor Kevin. He, he loves Jesus and he loves this church. He loves Calvary. He loves all of you. I get sick and tired of hearing him bragging about y'all, talking about you, but uh, he does a lot, so praise God. Would you pray with me? Let's stand together and pray as we prepare to open God's word this morning. Father God, we love you and we thank you. We have so many reasons to rejoice. The time we have together this morning is not enough, but Father, we thank you for each and every single blessing you have brought to us. We know your word tells us and our testimony tells us and our experience tells us that every good and perfect gift is from above. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Lord, you have brought us all through something this year. You haven't brought us all through the same thing, but you've all you brought us all through something. And Lord, uh, we just thank you for being there for that, for walking us through it, for blessing us. Lord, for bringing us to this day. Looks like we're all going to make it through another year. And Lord, we
Lord, we remember those who didn't. Father, we know they're at home in glory with you, and we rejoice even in that this day. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We pray now that you would bless us as we open your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles, open to Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 39. If it's your custom and you want to stand as we read that, I'll read it for us as we begin today. It says, He went out, this is Jesus, into all of Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Then a man with leprosy came to him on his knees. That's the right posture if you're going to come to Jesus. And he begged him. If you are willing, make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. I am willing, he told him, be made clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. Then he sternly warned him and sent him away at once, telling him, see that you say nothing to anyone but go and show yourself to the priest and offer what Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony. Now you can't miss that part. Jesus says, offer it and do this as a testimony to them. All right. Yet he went out and began to proclaim it widely, to spread the news with the result that Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but he was out in deserted places, and they came to him from everywhere. Praise God. You may be seated. Have you ever made a trade? I grew up uh, in a poor family. I learned pretty early on in life that if I was going to have the things I wanted, I had to make trades. You know, we start trading things when we're little, don't we? (laughs) We, we? We start trading things when we're babies. A couple years ago at our church, I wasn't preaching one Sunday, and uh, we were short some workers in the nursery, and so I did what every good preacher would do. I volunteered to work in the nursery, and I went, and I was watching those babies and, and trying to help as much as I can, and uh, two of these, these kids were sitting next to each other, and they had those little toys like babies have, the stuff with the little balls inside that rattle around and whatnot, and they're, they were just playing. They were content. They were happy. Everything was good, and then At one point, they both kind of looked at each other, and mind you, they're not talking yet. These are little kids. They looked at each other, and they made eye contact, and one of them did this, and the other did this, and they traded their toys before they could even talk. And then they traded their slobber because they had been chewing on them and gnawing on them, and they just started doing the same. I started trading when I was a little boy. I can remember being in grade school. My mama would pack my lunch. Any of your mamas ever pack your lunch? Going to school. My mama would pack my lunch, and we didn't have a lot. I usually had bologna, salami, and Cheetos. That's what I got for lunch every day. The problem was, as you can probably tell, I like pudding. But my mom, she would buy one pack of pudding every week, and on Friday, she would put the pudding in the lunch. Yeah, I look forward to Friday. But I didn't just want pudding on Friday. (laughs) I wanted pudding every day. (laughs) And so I learned pretty quick that if I wanted to have pudding every day, which you can tell I have accomplished (laughs) that, I was going to have to make some trades. And so I I, I would learn the people in my class who had pudding every day, and I would sit next to them, and then I would offer them a trade. It's hard to convince somebody to take your bologna sandwich for their pudding. But I found this one boy named Calvin. He liked bologna. And his mama put pudding in his lunch every day. So we'd make some trades. I remember being out on the, the, the playground, for recess and making trades. I traded G.I. Joes 
transformers, I mean the old school kind that were like metal and actually flipped around and made stuff. I traded pocket knives on the playground. This was a long time ago, y'all. You can't do that no more. But we would trade pocket knives with one another. We made all kinds of trades. I guess my point is, you know how to trade. You've all made a trade. When we get older, we keep trading things. The stakes just get higher, right? Instead of trading pocket knives, we're trading vehicles. We go trade one for another. Everything you do in life's a trade. Have you ever thought about it? How many of you got a job or had a job at some point in your life? Raise your hand if you had a job or got a job. You know that's a trade. You're trading your time for that paycheck. How many of you ever uh, uh, filled your car up with gas? Anybody ever pump some gas in your car? Yeah. It's a trade. You're trading your money for that gas. You ever called a plumber or an electrician or a HVAC man to come out to your house and fix that air conditioner in the middle of summer, that heater in the middle of winter? Guess what? That's a trade. You're trading his skill and his expertise and his tools for some of your money. Everything's a trade. Everything you're doing in life is a trade, a series of trades. So I would go out on a limb here, and I don't think I have to go out too far to say y'all are professional traders. You've all made trades. How many of you say amen if you've made a good trade in your life? How many of you have ever made a bad trade? Oh, yeah. Amen. We've got a testimony of both. We've made some good trades and we've made some bad trades. But we've all made trades. This text here near the end of Mark chapter 1 contains what I believe is the most fantastic and fascinating trade in all of the Gospels. It's a trade many people miss. Perhaps you didn't because you're professional traders. But boy, it's fascinating. There's three people in this text. Before we get to them, let me offer you the big idea for today, the thing I don't want you to miss. If you've got your bulletin, you want to write it down. It's that first blank right there at the top. And it says this, if Jesus offers you a trade, take it. If Jesus ever offers you a trade, take it. And I'll tell you why, because he is good and he is gracious and he is filled with mercy and love and he will never give you a bologna sandwich for your pudding. You're never going to come out on the short end with Jesus. If he offers you a trade, you take it every time. You don't even have to think about it. If I offer you a trade, you better think about it, because I'm a trader. I've been trading since I was a little kid. And I'm looking to get a good trade, and that probably means you're going to get a bad trade. All right. If your cousin or your brother or even your beloved pastor, Pastor Nelson, offers you a trade, you probably ought to think about it. All right. But if Jesus offers you a trade, just take it. Three people in the text. The first is what I call the weary man. The weary man. I say he's weary because there is no more fear, disease, and diagnosis in the ancient times than leprosy. I'm sure you've heard about leprosy, but leprosy was a death sentence. It wasn't just a, a physical death sentence. It was an emotional, a mental, a social death sentence. You did not want to be a leper. All right, all this right. man was weary because he had leprosy. Yeah. We don't know anything about him before he had leprosy, but we know the defining characteristic of him here in the gospel of Mark is that he is a leper. Leviticus chapter 13, 45 and 46. You don't need to turn there. I just want to read to you some of the, the things that lepers dealt with, some of the law around leprosy. It says the leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and shall let their hair of his head hang loose. 
He shall cover his upper lip and he shall cry out, unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone and his dwelling shall be outside the camp. Because it's contagious, highly contagious. So anyone with leprosy had to be physically identifiable. Their clothes would identify them. You could tell a leper from a long way away by the rags, the torn clothing that they were required by law to wear. They had to be verbally identifiable. A leper, when he came within a certain distance of anyone, had to cover his mouth because, again, this is contagious and scream out as loud as he or she could unclean unclean verbally identifying themselves they had to be socially identifiable as well socially in that they lived outside the camp they couldn't live inside the village they couldn't live inside the city they had to live outside the camp away from everyone else Unless, of course, there were other lepers. They could live with them, but not with anybody else. Masterman said this about leprosy. He said, no other disease reduces a human being for so many years to so hideous a wreck. Another commentator wrote, lepers were people who were already dead, though they were still alive. This man is weary. The physical toll of leprosy was excruciating. The mental toll of leprosy was agonizing. The social toll would have been nothing short of terrible. Imagine being totally isolated, stripped away from your family and your friends, your spouse, your job. Being absolutely forbidden from going anywhere without being identifiable to everyone as unclean. Suffering in seclusion, suffering in silence without any hope of a cure because leprosy in these days, in fact, until the 19th century was uncurable. So there's no doubt he's a weary man. He's a worn out man. He's a worried man. He's a desperate man. He's a disturbed and discouraged and distressed man. I think it's safe to say he's a demoralized man, a distraught man, and a devastated man, which all adds up to one thing. This man is weary. I tell you what he is not. He is not a happy man. He is not a hopeful man. And he is not a holy man when he comes to Jesus. The man with leprosy, it says in verse 40, came to him on his knees and begged him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He was on his knees. The Gospel of Luke records it and says he fell face down. He put his, he put his face in the dirt in front of Jesus and he is begging Jesus to make a trade. All right, all right. He wants to trade this dreaded, awful disease for something. He, he doesn't even know what, but he wants to trade it for anything. He comes to Jesus and wants to trade. And again, I remind you, if Jesus ever offers you a trade, you take it. And that's where we find point number two, and that's what I call the willing Messiah. He comes to Jesus on his face in the dirt humbly on his knees, begging for a trade, and he finds a willing Messiah. This man knows his condition cannot be cured. He knows money can't fix it. He knows medicine can't fix it. He knows time won't fix it. He knows only God can fix it. Amen. So he comes to the feet of Jesus. Look at verse 41. Moved with compassion those good words moved with compassion Jesus reached out his hand and touched him I am willing he told him be made clean and immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean 
Jesus, a couple of points here, Jesus is moved with compassion. We've all felt the compassion of Jesus in our life. That's easy. That's easy ground to tread and break and preach. But let me ask you this. Have you ever felt compassion for someone or something? Have you ever been, been moved with compassion? Has your heart ever broke for a situation? For a conflict? For a relationship? For a friend? For a family member? For a stranger on the street? What did you do with your compassion? You see, most of the time, I mean, it's one thing to be moved with compassion, and I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about me. And I'm, there are many times I'm moved with compassion, and I do nothing about it. Amen. All right, all right. Many of us, we're, we're moved with compassion, but we don't ever do anything. I want you to notice that Jesus wasn't just moved to compassion. He did something. He touched it. So I would tell you this, church, if you are moved with compassion, there's a reason for it. There's a reason God moved you to compassion. You need to do something Amen. about it. You need to do something with it. You need to do something for those that you are moved to compassion for. But Jesus, he reached out his hand and he touched it. I want you to notice the order of things here. It, it says that... Before Jesus healed him, he touched him. He didn't heal him and then touch him. He touched him and then healed him. All right, all right. There's a difference in those two things. This man hasn't been touched in a long time, church. <laughs> he has not been touched. He's a leper. Socially identifiable. Verbally identifiable. He's awkward everywhere he goes. Nobody touches this man ever. We don't know how long, but he hasn't been touched. And his face is in the dirt. He is on his knees with his head down. And then can you imagine when he feels a touch? The text doesn't say it, but I got to imagine a shiver went up his spine. <laughs> he probably had to wonder who is touching me. I, I picture it in my head as if he probably jolted, kind of startled. Have you, have you ever been touched when you weren't expecting it and you kind of went like, Woo, who, that's, who's that? He's not expecting anybody to touch him, but Jesus does. And I tell you this, if, if he wasn't startled, everybody watching was. Because you don't touch a leper. But Jesus did. This is a foreign feeling a forgotten touch upon the skin of a leper. Moved with compassion, he touched him before he healed him. I think he wanted to show him that he was loved even though he was sick. He was loved even though he was in trouble. He was loved even though nobody else cared about him. He, Jesus wanted, said, I'm going to touch you first and I'll heal you second. Because... There, there's something more powerful about that when you're talking about a leper. It's a different story if he heals him and then he touches him. But he touched him and then he healed him. Jesus didn't have to touch him to heal him. We can all testify to reading scripture time and time again where Jesus healed somebody he never touched. Healed people he never saw. Healed people he was never even around. He doesn't have to touch him to heal him. He doesn't have to touch him to have compassion on him. He doesn't have to touch him to change his life forever. He doesn't have to touch him, but he touched him anyway. The point is, it's great to have compassion. It's great to care. But when your heart is moved and you feel that compassion welling up, don't miss the opportunity to reach out and touch somebody. Because that touch can make a difference in their life. I know this church reaches out and touches a lot of people in this community. And you should be praised and honored and thankful for that. Don't stop next year touching people. Second thing that jumps out about this part of the text to me is this weary, weak man has no 
doubt that Jesus has the power to heal him. He, he knows that Jesus has the power to do it. And we don't, we don't know why. We don't know how he knows this. Perhaps he had seen Jesus heal somebody else. Maybe he had heard testimony from someone else that Jesus was doing these healings. Maybe he had seen with his own eyes Jesus do it. We don't know. But whatever it was, the question never for this man is, can you heal me? Do you have the power to heal me? This weary man says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He knows Jesus has the power. His question is, are you willing? I bring this up because I think for many of us, it's easier for us to comprehend and believe in the power of God than it is the mercy of God. Many of us know God can, we just wonder if God will. We have full confidence that he can, we have full confidence that he has the power to do it, we just wonder if his mercy is going to touch us. I know some of us, perhaps even many of us, are in that place right now somewhere in our lives. We know that God can. We just wonder if he will save our marriage. We we know God can. We just wonder if he will bless our family. We know God can. We just wonder if he will help our health. You see, it's a lot easier to believe in the power of God than it is the mercy of God. We know God is able, we just wonder if he will. We know God has the power, we just wonder if he will. I want to encourage you as we're ending this year and launching into another one, don't just believe in the power of God, believe in the mercy of God. Believe in the compassion of your Savior. He is a willing Messiah, and if Jesus offers you a trade, take it. Number three, we have a third man in this text. I call him the wayward missionary. He's the same man as as the weary man at the beginning, except Jesus has changed his life. How many of you know from experience and testimony by amens that when Jesus changes your life, you become a new man or a new woman? Amen? The Apostle Paul said, the old man is what? Gone. And the new has come. This is the same man's flesh, but it's a different man's spirit. It's the same man's body, but it's a totally different man we see at the end of this text. And he's a wayward missionary, unfortunately. I wish the story ended better. Something has changed inside of this man. He's brand new. This weary man is healed. And then look at verse 43. It says, then he sternly warned him. Has your mama ever sternly warned you? Did your daddy ever sternly warn you? When you have you ever sternly warned your kids? Now, when you sternly warn somebody, or if you are sternly warned, A stern warning is a couple of things. A stern warning is clear. A stern warning is is easily identifiable. When my mama or my daddy used to sternly warn me, I knew that was the last warning. I knew there were no more warnings coming after that. I knew the line had been drawn and, and it was clear what I was supposed to do or not do. Jesus sternly warned him. This is a clear warning. And he sent him away at once, telling him, here's the warning, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer what Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet... He went out and began to proclaim it widely and to spread the news. He gets a stern warning. 
And Jesus has good reason for this warning. He wants this to be a testimony to the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the religious leaders who are wreaking havoc on his ministry and will to the end. He wants them to see for their own eyes, with their own eyes. He wants this to be a testimony to them. I believe Jesus also wanted this man to go to the priest because he wants him to be publicly um, publicly renewed. He wants him to be able to come into town. He wants him to be, be, be considered clean again. And the only way to do that is through the priest. He's doing this not just for the testimony of the religious leaders. He's doing it so this man can be restored into society. This is for the man and it's for the religious leaders. It's for many reasons. But Jesus sternly warns him and says, See that you say nothing to anyone. Oh, but he didn't do that. He went right out and did the opposite. That's why I call him a a wayward missionary. He's a missionary, all right, but he's wayward. He's not doing what Jesus told him to do. He went out and began to proclaim it widely and to spread the news. Now, now please hear me. I'm not saying I'd have done any better. <laughs> I get it. This guy's excited. He's jacked up. He, he, he is on fire. I, I want to tell some people, too, if I get healed from leprosy that's unhealable, uncurable. I'd want to tell people, too, if, if, if this had happened in my life. I, I, I get it. I understand his heart. And, and I, understand just, I understand more than just his heart. I understand exactly what this is like. Because I've disobeyed Jesus <laughs> after a stern warning. I've kept my mouth shut when it was supposed to be open, and I've shut my mouth when it was supposed to be open, and I've opened my mouth when it was supposed to be shut. Probably the only one in the room. I've gone where I shouldn't have gone. I've not gone where I was supposed to go. I'm just like the Apostle Paul, a wretched man who does what he does not want to do and knows he should not do, but just can't help but keep on doing it. I know what this is like. I, I felt this. I'm not condemning this man. I'm not judging this man. I'm not saying I'm any better than this man. I know I would have struggled just like this man to keep my mouth shut. Hmm. But I want you to consider the consequences of his sin. Because all disobedience to Jesus is sin. Even if our heart is in the right place, if, if we're disobedient, we're sinning. And all sin has a consequence. We'll never know the full scope of his disobedience. And I know this man was excited and I'm sure his intentions were pure and his heart was right. And he just couldn't keep quiet. I guess the lesson from this part of the story is God's plan is always the right plan. And God's plan is... God's way is always the right way. And our way should never be substituted for God's way. And our plan should never be substituted for God's plan. Even if our plan makes more sense to us and even if our plan... Seems like our heart's in the right place. We should do what Jesus tells us to do. Because look at verse 45. Yet he went out and began to proclaim it widely and spread the news with the results. Here's the trade I spoke of at the beginning. The trade that I'm sure you professional traders all saw. With the result that Jesus could no longer enter a town openly. But he was out in deserted places, and they had to come to him from everywhere. It's right here that that trade I spoke of at the beginning happened. He didn't just trade his, his hurt for a healing. He didn't just trade his pain and suffering with leprosy for a healing. 
No, Jesus trades places with the man. In a very real way, Jesus trades places with this weary man at the beginning of the story. Because at the beginning, the man with leprosy is on the outside. At the end, Jesus is on the outside. At the beginning, it's this man who can't enter a town. At the end, it's Jesus who can't enter town. At the beginning, it's this man who's confined to isolated and deserted places. At the end, it's Jesus who's confined to isolated and deserted places. And that's why I tell you, if Jesus ever offers you a trade, you better take it. Because he ain't going to give you a bologna sandwich and steal your pudding. You're always going to come out better with Jesus if he's offering you a trade. Some of you might be thinking, man, I wish I could make a trade like that. I wish I could get something like that in my life. Well, I got great news. He's still trading. <laughs> oh, yeah. Jesus is still offering trades today. Here on the last day of the year, some of y'all need to make some trades. Some of y'all need to do some trading. You need to trade that sorrow for joy. <laughs> He'll make the trade today. You need to trade your shame and your guilt from your past for the freedom you have in Christ right now, today. You need to trade your fear and your anxiety for the peace that surpasses understanding. Trade your loneliness for the love that only God can give you. Trade your brokenness for holiness. Trade your hurt for healing. And you can trade your sin for salvation. He is still making trades today. And you know what's crazy to me, church? How many people pass up these good trades? How many people look at Jesus and say, Oh, he's trying to get my pudding. Oh, that's going to be a bad trade. No, if he offers you a trade... You take it. I can't believe how many people still pass it up, especially the cross. Calvary. What did Jesus do on the cross? He traded places with you. He died on your cross for your sins. So you could be saved and live forever. It's the best trade that's ever happened in history. And there are people in this room that have probably never taken that trade. People on your street and in this town that have never taken that trade. Because they hadn't heard, I guess, that when Jesus offers you a trade, you take it. I want to close with the word of prayer for you today. And as we pray, I want you to consider what you need to trade on this last day of the year. Don't, don't haul your junk and your garbage into next year. Trade it today, here, right now, in this place. And maybe it's your sin you need to get rid of. Maybe you need to call on Jesus. Repent, believe, confess. Cry out to him on your knees and let him reach out and touch you. He'll trade places with you just like he did this man. Let's pray and then you can trade. Father God, we come before you now. and Lord, we thank you that you are a God who loves us, a God who cares for us. A God that we never have to look at with suspicion A God, we never have to wonder or second guess, is this going to be a good trade or not? Because you are a good father. 
a holy God who loves us, who cares for us. So Lord, I pray right now for any who can hear my voice. If they need to make a trade, I pray that they would do it today because your arms are open wide. Father, if they need to trade that sin for salvation, Lord, may they repent this day, in this place, this hour, and experience the power of your touch. Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. We look forward to next year with great anticipation because we know you're going to walk it with us every step of the way. We thank you for your time and your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Calvary. The good news is that the trading center is open. This is your time to make that decision. As the ministers and the deacons and the counselors come to stand, you can make that decision this day. That whatever you're holding on to, and you know it's not working for you, that you can trade it right now. And the good news is that God loves you even as you make the decision on the last day of the year. You can wake up tomorrow shouting, I'm free. I'm free. Thank God Almighty. I'm free. If you're here this morning, please make your way. As the choir sings, those who are watching if you look at the website you'll know that we ask that you call the church you too can make a decision because it's at that very moment that you say yes to Christ that you're saved that very moment if you're here this morning please come Trading block is open. I am grateful for the things that you have done. Yes, I'm won't grateful you come, won't you come? for the victory we won. Oh, 
the great trade. How many are truly grateful for the great trade? Amen. Thank you, Pastor Pete, for blessing us today with such a rich, real, and relevant word. Amen. 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 Yeah, come on, Calvary. Yeah. 
Can, can I tell y'all? Y'all know I'm borderline crazy. <laughs> but when I met Pastor Pete, his beard was longer. And he had this big old cowboy hat on. And we both standing there waiting for the shuttle to pick us up. And so he gets on, I get on, and we start talking. So I just knew he had to be going to a cattle drive or something. <laughs> I say, I know he ain't going to church. <laughs> And, and he went on, when he said, where are you going? And I told him, I said, where are you going? He, he said, I'm going to the Baptist General Convention. I said, oh, my Lord. <laughs> I, I said that to say that humorously, but this truthfully. A lot of times in life, we judge the cover without knowing the contents. Am I in the room? A whole lot of times we judge the cover without really knowing the contents. Thank you, Pastor Pete, for not only blessing us today, but being a friend. Amen. 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 Well, let me share with you, Calvary. We'll, I'm going to share with you a couple of housekeeping things. Then we will acknowledge anyone worshiping with us uh, for the first time. And then we'll prepare to worship by way of giving. Uh, here at Calvary, uh, offering time is probably the shortest part of our service. Amen. But we do challenge you to give. We are a tithes and offering uh, church. We don't do no buying and selling. Amen. We don't do no trading. Amen. Amen. So I, even now, I'm going to ask that you would prepare because we do believe that giving is a part of worship. Amen. And you have not worshipped until you have given. And Jesus gave us that great paradigm, that great example. All of y'all know John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave. Amen. Amen. And so even now prepare uh, to worship God by way of giving. This is the last Sunday of the year, and I want to challenge all of you, amen, relative to your giving. Be faithful to God. And how many of you know God will be faithful unto you? C can I just say this? Won't he do it? Yes, he will. Amen. Well, let me highlight a couple of things. Um, today will be our last 9 o'clock service. On so next Sunday, we will move back into our 8 o'clock worship, 9.30 Sunday school, and then 10.50 worship. Amen. Next Sunday, we will not have, we'll have our regular Sunday school classes. They will be hybrid and in person. But in the sanctuary, we'll have a class on fasting. Uh, along with that class on fasting, we'll have a, a, a session on meal prepar preparation. And then you can also prepare for the biggest losers contest. Amen. Calvary, y'all ready for your 21 days of fasting? Amen. Amen. Now, I, I didn't told y'all what I do. Uh, and now y'all ain't got to do what I do, but this is what I do. I know that during my 21 days of fasting, uh, everything gets right. So I set all my doctor's appointments at the end of January.
And when I go in, they say, he said, oh, Brother Nelson, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. And I'll be saying, Doc, you just don't know how hungry I am. I said, all oh, your doctors, if you can't get in in January, make sure you get in in February. Yeah. But we're ready, getting ready to enter into our 21 days of fasting. We'll have a class relative to fasting. We'll have a class to kind of talk about meal preparations. And then we'll also have our biggest loser contest. Brother uh, and sister Linda and Jerry East will give leadership to our biggest loser contest. Y'all know uh, everyone that weighs in on Sunday, uh, and you have to weigh in every every Sunday consecutively. Give ten dollars, and at uh, the end of our twenty-one day fasting on that last Sunday, we will uh, have our weigh in and then acknowledge first, second, and third place for both men and women. Amen. Now, fasting isn't to lose weight. That's just a blessing and a byproduct of, of fasting. Amen. It's really us getting closer to God. Let, let me just ask, let me just ask, any first-time possible fasters, any, anyone, well, this will be your first time fasting? All right, all right, all right, you're going to join us, right? All right, then, we do have manuals. Matter of fact, if you, uh, I believe there are some prepared today. If you check with me after service, I may have some in the office uh, available even on today. How many of you know the blessing of fasting? How many of you have experienced God after you have fasted? Amen. Amen. So I'm looking for uh, a blessing. I'm looking for a breakthrough. Uh, I'm looking for God to do great things during our 21-day fast. And that just kind of prepares us for, for the new year. Amen. So again, next Sunday, 8 o'clock, those 8 o'clock worshipers, uh, 9.30 Sunday school. If you want to go to regular Sunday school and don't want to go to the fasting, that's, that's fine. Uh, and then our 1050 service. Also next Sunday is our membership roundup. What I want to challenge you to do, Calvary, uh, over the last couple of weeks, if you have not seen some of our members, reach out and touch them. You heard Pastor Pete. Amen. He says some people need a touch. Amen. Some people need a touch. And, and you may not be able to touch them, but you can show a call them. Amen. 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 Uh, so I want to challenge you. Uh, I've all, I, I, I didn't make it back to consecration, but men of Calvary, men of Calvary. Let me get all the men of Calvary to stand. Men of Calvary, come on, stand all over the building. Stand all over the building. Amen. Thank you so very much. Men of Calvary, what I want to challenge us for 2024, y'all know first Sunday, uh, the men give leadership to the worship. I'd love to see our choir stand full with me. Amen. Amen. I, I love y'all would make my heart glad. I know we can do it again. I know that during the pandemic, uh, it's, it's coming back. We we haven't got back into that num the numbers, but brothers, I'd love to have all of our men. Even if you can't sing, if you can make a joyful noise. <laughs> can't you, can't Pat, can we make them sound good? <laughs> you may be seated. Thank you, brothers. Uh, I, I, <laughs> uh, so I, I, I challenge you, I challenge you um, to, uh, to uh, uh, join us uh, relative to our music ministry. 
uh, on next Sunday. All of our first Saturday meetings will take place. I meet with the preachers at 8 a.m., meet with the deacons at 9, and then uh, also at 9, the uh, ministers, wives, and deaconess, they will have their meetings. So all of our first Saturday meetings will take place. We'll also observe the Lord's Supper in both services. Those of you that take the Lord's Supper virtually, you're able to come by the church office starting on Wednesday, uh, Wednesday to pick up your communion cups so that you may be able to worship and celebrate in the Lord's Supper with us even virtually. Amen. All right. I believe, I believe, I believe that's all, folks. Um, oh, two things. Kudos to Brother Michael Potts, our minister of music. Uh, he came out with his Christmas single. Uh, Av, yeah, yeah, that is. And and what what I want to get, uh, if y'all will, back in the audiovisual, after we get out, if y'all will play that, and so y'all get a chance to hear it, check out our very own Brother Potts, his Christmas uh, hit. Amen. Amen. Want to give him some some kudos. Uh, secondly, uh, Pastor Pete has some books, and his books are available in the cafeteria area. Uh, Sister Arnell will give leadership. They are ten dollars. Go by and check them out. Let's be a blessing unto him, as he has been a blessing unto us. Uh, he has a great uh, devotional. Uh, uh, so if you're looking for something to kick off the year with, that may be something that can aid you, something that can assist you along the way. Amen. All right, then. I believe that is it. That's it. Anyone worshiping with us for the first time, anyone worshiping with us for the first time, would you please stand? We want to put something in your hand as a token that you shared. Amen. Glad to have you. Just remain standing. Just remain standing. If this is your first time, just remain standing. We want to put something in your hand. Amen. All right, all right, all right. Thank you. Thank you. We know that when it comes to churching, there are other good churches, there are other great churches in San Antonio, but we just believe if you're going to make it to heaven, you got to go by. Calvary. Amen. Thank you for choosing Calvary as your place of worship. Uh, at this time, Dr. Anderson is going to lead us in our time of giving. Um, Dr. Anderson, let me do this because I, I, I did this and I messed it up. But, but if you'll lead us in our time of giving, I've asked our new preacher, uh, Reverend Pleasant, to lead us in our closing prayer and benediction. Amen. Amen. Happy New Year. Anybody fixing chitterlings? Y'all act like y'all don't eat no chitlins. Oh, I'm sorry, I got an education. Chitterlings. Y'all know y'all some chitlin eaters. All right, what about hog mark? Oh, uh oh, oh, pig feet. Cow tongue. <laughs> Black eyed peas. Yams. Cornbread. Let, let me tell you, we were in California uh, uh, for uh, the holidays. We we went to see Mickey and Minnie, and uh, I, I, y'all know I, I'm I'm old, but but I still got a childlike mindset. So we went to hang out with Mickey and Minnie, and man, I had the best seven green gumbo. It, it, it had greens, yams, okra, white beans, rice, chicken, and sausage. 
it, 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 was, it, it was good. Now, you know, I'm older and my stomach can't handle. So, you know, those are those, that, that's one of the meals you got to eat and make sure you're close to the room. So I really couldn't enjoy it. So any of my Louisiana members that want to bless the pastor, I want some seven green gumbo, but I want to eat it when I'm at home. <laughs> Happy New Year. God bless you. God keep you. God's face, may it shine upon you and give you peace. Love you. Love you much. I wish I could hug each and every one of you, so I'll just do it like this. Amen. Come on, Dr. Anderson. Amen. God is good. What would church be like if you couldn't laugh? You know, what kind of God are we serving? But it's giving time. And while Pastor Pete was the only one to preach today, we all have an opportunity to give. If you have those envelopes already, you take them out and hold them in your hand and know that God is ready to bless you. The prophet says, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there might be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will not pour you out a blessing that the windows of heaven cannot hold. I don't know what all those blessings are, but I don't believe that it's just money. I believe it's your health. I believe it's your wealth. I believe it's your jaw. Ushers, please come forward. The ushers are going to pass the baskets.
Let us stand. While we give God thanks. Boy, even Pastor Nelson is a little taller than me, I think. Amen. Heavenly Father, the cattle on a thousand hills are yours. Thank you for that portion which you've allowed us to hold and return to you. Make these gifts that we have returned edify the kingdom of God. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And as this is the last day of the year, may the grace of God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the communion with the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with you until we meet again. Let the church say together, amen. amen.